And my name is Virginia Robbins. Uh, so first to introduce myself, um, um, I'm from France originally. I'm currently working at uh, Intel ASEC G, uh, primarily McAfee for 10 plus years as a senior security software engineer in the Endpoint Security Group. I'm co-founder of uh, Tiara Khan, it's a new con, and member of DC 503. Uh, so I'm interested in malware research and cryptography. Uh, so I recently got two new kittens, <laughs> which I love spending time with. Uh, disclaimer, so this is on my own time. So any view expressed here are solely my own and do not represent uh, those of my employer. That's the one. So uh, goal of this talk. Um, so the goal of this talk is to gain understanding of latest fileless file malware or such type of malware can add the new evasion technique? What are their application in latest attacks? And what are the possible ways fileless malware of the future could hide to evade detection? So first of all, before we dig into fileless malware, we have to ask ourselves, what, what's the difference between fileless malware and regular malware? Uh, so basically, what is a regu um, regular malware? A regular malware, um, is typically stored in the malware binary file in the file system to run malicious code. And uh, unlike their predecessor, this new type of fileless malware will no longer drop small compiled binaries on the compromised system during malicious activities. So typically, the, new, the latest uh, technique uh, is primarily to hide in the registry then they let themselves before running their malicious code. So let's, let's go through some past technique to evade detection um, to get a background. Uh, so in the past, uh, malware developers uh, try to implement different techniques to circumvent detection of their malicious code. Uh, so they did it through different layers of, uh, of uh, the system. Um, so one of the ways to uh, have it in memory, memory reason malware, they also use the kernel, so we create a kernel rootkit. Uh, they also hide it in startup code such as uh, bootkits. Uh, they also uh, try to hide in the firmware, so our firmware rootkit, and uh, also in the VM-based hypervisor rootkit for VM system. Uh, so what, what is a memory reason malware? So uh, a memory reason malware load their code into the memory of legitimate pro process, even OS files. They remain there until activated, then run the malicious code. So uh, it's almost considered fileless uh, because uh, they run in the memory space of the process, uh, but it's not fileless in the sense um, that it is uh, currently in the latest fileless uh, malware. So if example of such malware are Angular and, and one exploit kit. Uh, also, so kernel rootkit malware, uh, they clog themselves in the kernel and they add or replace core OS kernel component and device drivers. So they hide by changing the kernel data structure via direct kernel manipulation. They hook uh, the system descriptor table or system call table in Linux. And to get, to make rootkit more difficult, uh, it's advised to only run signed driver in Windows. Uh, so the next uh, kind of uh, way to hide is to hide in the firmware and hardware via rootkit malware. So we utilize uh, firmware to generate infected image in hardware. Typical targeted hardware affected uh, can be routers, network card, hard drive, uh, or BIOS even. And the problem is that there's not enough uh, integrity verification in that layer to, uh, to be able to detect them easily. So it, it's, a, it's a great ground for malware to, to conceal themselves. So now we're gonna move into the, the latest evasion technique. Um, for fileless malware. So how are currently uh, typical fileless malware evade detection? So 
right navigating via a file or link in uh, email or vulnerability in a script plugin, for instance. After the user clicks the link of a file, they write their payload into the re Windows registry and then disappear. Uh, the script uh, is hidden in the registry via diverse techniques. Um, so they, first of all, they ob obfuscate themselves from registry inspection by removing the user access privileges. They had a null character in the registry key name, so you cannot view them via regedit. Uh, they call le legitimate programs such as, uh, currently the, uh, the hot one is PowerShell. They are also in the past, they did WMI uh, to insert malicious code into memory or standard uh, Windows processes. So here you can see the, the flow uh, of, a, of a infection. Uh, so basically there's like spam campaign or malicious website uh, that uh, get clicked and the dropper, um, uh, you know, creates uh, all the, pay, uh, the, regist uh, the registry entry and add the JavaScript. Um, and then that JavaScript uh, through different la uh, level um, end up calling something like PowerShell or WMI, and which is decrypt the different script it, that they get decrypted and then run. So, uh, so like I was saying, um, WMI used to be uh, something that was used uh, a couple years ago. Uh, so what is WMI is a Microsoft implementation of WBM, which is an initiative to develop a standard technology for accessing management information in an enterprise environment. And so it can be used by uh, fileless malware to execute malicious JavaScript. And more recently, PowerShell. So what is PowerShell? It's a, it's a task automation and configuration management framework from Microsoft. It's consisting of a command line shell and associated scripting language built on the .NET framework. That's the uh, official uh, definition. Um, so base64 encrypted malicious payload is written into the registry and then typically executed using the PowerShell script. So here's an example of uh, uh, a PowerShell call in the registry. Um, so they, there's a decrypted function coded in the registry that calls the PowerShell executable, uh, which runs the encrypted payload code. So what are the applications of Fireless Malware in later Stalak? So we have seen um, click fraud bot. So the more resources the system has, the more our traffic uh, it generates, and the more money it makes for the criminals. It has also been seen in ransomware attacks. So they encrypt the victim file and request a ransom to get the decryption key. Also seen in banking trojan. So they use only banking uh, system to obtain confidential financial data. So now example of finance malware. Uh, so PowerLeaks and Kofter are the, the more common ones. Uh, so they connect via website and click through ad. They transform the inset infected system into a click bot, offer some variant, they download ransomware payloads. Also, um, XSW kit, uh, which is a variant of a uh, good kit, face bot, and the, it actually a clone of PowerLix. It adds additional functionality by bypassing the USC and starting startup method. It uh, has been used in uh, banking Trojan and malware downloader. So it was first focused on stealing info from French bank and then it, they expanded to European banks. And finally, the one we're gonna uh, be looking at is Yabist. Yabest. So this used like a older technique, um, WMI to hijack browser shortcut, but it's a newer malware, so I thought it was interesting to, uh, to talk about it. So we're gonna first go through a, a small di deep dive of Parallax. 
so what are the infection steps for Powerex specifically? So it ought to start from the run registry key with a hidden uh, null character entry. So they cannot be viewed uh, via registry editors. Uh, they remove user level permission on the associated keys to hide both from security products and user accessibility by revoking ACOL permissions. Uh, they had also an encoded script in the default run entry, and their hidden run key called JavaScript to decode and run the encoded script. Uh, so here's um, anyone that would try to run regedit uh, would not be able to even see anything. Uh, so it, to them, it would look like Everything is great. Uh, so uh, the decoding, once the script is decoded, it first check, checks to see if PowerShell and .NET framework are installed on the system. And then it executes more code store in base 64 to change the permission of section of memory so code written to it can be executed. It could get proc address of some exported kernel 32 DLL and user 32 DLL to be able to interact with the system. A script a variable is used to store the shared code and an embedded DLL. And once the DLL runs, it calls its malicious payload. So uh, now we're going to go into Kofter uh, in a more detailed deep dive which is kind of similar to, to the first one, but this one is, uh, has been, uh, we have done more um, uh, research on it. Um, so what are the infection steps of Kofter? So first of all, uh, sta sta uh, it started to morph into fileless malware in later versions, so it was not always a fileless malware. Uh, so what it first do, it check to see if PowerShell is already present, and then if not, as the other one, um, and it check if uh, the user, the system has online access and download PowerShell, downloads PowerShell. Um, it add a value to one or more registry run key to run a JavaScript via MSH star program. And similar to PowerLeak, it hide their registry entries by starting value name with null or zero byte character, followed by a series of X characters. So here, um, if, you, if, you look, uh, if you look at the registry via a different tool and regulate it, uh, that, can, uh, that not, do not hide null by character uh, registry entry, you will see um, the, the, the key, which is um, Xcode, uh, and the call to MSH star JavaScript. And if you see that, then that's a... Uh, that's most likely a malware. <laughs> All right. Um, so that JavaScript, um, we call a different JavaScript from another reg registry entry. So basically, there's, it, it writes different registry entry to hoop into different uh, layers. Uh, so the following is the value of a registry that points to another registry key on the other, this time the HK current user software entry. Uh, MSH star JavaScript uh, and call some uh, ActiveX object um, and with some uh, different arguments. So this second JavaScript decode and execute a malicious PowerShell script embedded in its scripted code. The PowerShell script run a shell code that reads another registry entry <laughs> which contain the fileless uh, malicious code. It decrypts it and loads it into memory. Once the fileless infection is loaded, then it deletes the file infector from disk. So by the time the, the infection happens, there's no trace in the file system. Uh, so here is the, uh, the different registry key uh, in the HK current user software encoded and obfuscated. So it looks like gibberish, and that's a good indication it's a malware. <laughs> if you see any key that looks strange like that, 
not good. Uh, so cluster JavaScript code detail. The following is the JavaScript code. Um, is the output of the first level uh, the obfuscation. And uh, as you can see, it's a base 64 encoded share code. So um, it tries really hard to hide itself. So once you dec decode uh, the base 64 share code, uh, then you can clearly see then now the PowerShell script to execute the watchdog script. Uh, so the PowerShell execution, what it does, uh, it executes the malicious code in the memory of legitimate system file to stay in memory undetected. So typically, uh, the three major one they use, it uses it's uh, reg svr32.exe, svco.exe, drhost.exe. Uh, and once the PowerShell code executes, it establishes a connection with a control server. And then you're toast. <laughs> it collects lots of information from the host machine and perform a series of action. So first of all, it will collect um, system info like OS, version, service pack, architecture. It tests if .NET is present, Adobe Flash Player, and latest browser version. Um, it analyzes the system resources. Uh, it di dynamically receives information from the control server, allowing them to manipulate the attacks without impacting the user and without detection. Uh, so the more resources or power the machine has, the more traffic it, it will, is seen on the network after that. So the evasion technique uh, used by Kofter um, uh, so it, one of them is uh, it check if uh, the machine is running as a VM uh, and whether it has on-time malware products and any monitor to monitoring tools. So some of the inf information collected from OS like include um, antivirus product like McAfee vi virus scan enterprise, antivirus shark, anti-VMware. is also check for the presence of specific application, uh, .NET framework, uh, Adobe, like I said, latest, latest Internet Explorer browser. So why do, does it check for that? Because these applications are required so that website with flash-based advertisement can be accessed and click cover, covertly without detection. So Quarter has a click bot. So it's, it's, it's actually aimed to infiltrate the victim system and transform it into a, a click bot. Uh, the click fraud makes money for attackers. So that's the uh, attraction. It takes advantage of uh, the paperclip advertising model. Advertiser pay the website publisher when an ad is clicked. Uh, some also Quarter variant uh, have downloaded additional payloads that belong to the crypto world family. Uh, once the system uh, has been evaluated, then Crofter prepare a browser to crawl through all the pages of the website and click all advertisements. The control server dynamically pushes uh, site hosting ad and they are clicked randomly. So at this point, uh, the infected system has been transformed into a click bot continuously performing uh, fraudulent clicks on advertisement. Quarter contains hard-coded uh, search string uh, so used to populate web pages hosting related advertisements, which are ra randomly clicked by the malware using built-in code. OK, uh, so the, the third um, uh, malware we're going to deep dive to is called Yebist. It's pretty new, but it uses some old techniques. Um, so it hijacks browser shortcut by adding as a browser executable argument, um, HTTPS slash slash uh, uh, So as a result, yebis.cc and or top yeah sites, as it's called, automatically open whenever the browser gets started. Uh, so what's the inf infection goal? Uh, to steal user data, 
to generate uh, lots of traffic via pay-per-click meta to make money. Uh, so it's yeah best is considered fileless because it only remains in the WMI. It deletes themselves when run and do not create file on the hard drive. So the so WMI uh, hiding typically they register themselves in the root subscription namespace uh, as an instance of the active script even consumer class. And here's the uh, you can clearly see here. The instance is called ASEC and contains a VB script which run every 10 seconds. And the VB script, uh, here's uh, some of the content of the VB script. Uh, it uh, checks for uh, the existence of 14 different browsers to inject, to hijack. Yeah, so interestingly, um, uh, it calls uh, SCRCUNS, the EXE instead of WScript, the EXE to ev evade detection further. Uh, and then here's um, what it does to the browser shortcut. It, um, it adds the YBIS uh, uh, browser, browser uh, startup. And then when you start browser, then that's what you will see. <laughs> So the persistence in fileless malware. So uh, we, uh, there's a consideration that we might need to trade off persistence for stealth because there's no trace in the file system. But it's less of an issue now than it was in the past because it takes less effort um, to achieve persistence in other days as uh, devices remain online for a longer time, going to sleep with fewer reboots in between. So as a result, malicious code can run for days without interruptions. And uh, most are lead for attack where implementation of a long-term persistence is not really required for success. For instance, in ransomware, attack family fileless malware need to only remain alive long enough to encrypt and remove original file then ask for a ransom. And so um, now we're gonna move to, uh, to question. Um, so here's some related work source reference links. And um, so one question I have is what are the possible ways could fileless malware hide to evade detection in the future? Okay. Um, yeah. yeah um, uh, how will fileless malware possibly change when uh, Microsoft has a more secure version of PowerShell? I mean, PowerShell 10 was going to put a lot of this stuff to the end. What would you see as the next vector of attack? Yeah, that's, that's a good question because really uh, PowerShell um, has some definite uh, vulnerability to it uh, and it's too open and too powerful. Um, so if Microsoft fix that, um, I don't know. I don't know what they're going to use. Um, WMI was one, PowerShell, so we have to constantly be uh, on the guard and and anything that Microsoft releases um, that is to help remote administrator um, uh, control remotely another machine, stay on your guard because that could be a, a place where malware would uh, will do malicious activities. Thank you. <laughs> Any question, next question? question? Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, on an average day, how much can the fraudsters make off one block? Um, I would have to look it up to, to, to answer that. I don't have all the greedy detail like that. I, I know they make a lot of money. <laughs> okay. So in, uh, in many of the examples that you gave, the initial infection was still by a, a file, something that was clicked or downloaded. Um, are there any examples, and then it was cleaned up afterwards. Are there examples that you have of, of purely fileless where even the initial infection isn't by an executable file? Yeah, I mean, like if you click uh, an email, if you click a link in an email, um, it will run in the context of an uh, email or in the context of a browser. So it's not really a file in the, in the, an additional file, an additional executable, sorry, in the file system. It's part of a browser. Uh, which um, has access to um, to write to the registry. Um, yeah, and um, 
even even if there's a like a payload or a file that is dropped, it gets quickly removed before the infection even uh, starts. So any um, uh, traditional anti anti malware product, which only focus on uh, looking at the file system, will not detect uh, until it's too late. Um, so obviously. Uh, Company, many companies are um, guarding against that now by, uh, by behavioral detection and, and things like that. So, I think you might have answered my question just now, but I was going to ask, why do you think malware families are evolving to use this sort of file as persistence or uh, using the registry as a persistence mechanism? Yeah, because typically, uh, like I was saying, typically on time malware product, we're highly focusing on detection uh, like signature detection, um, hash and of of file in the file system, and this this kind of infection you cannot detect via those um, those engines that just detect um, files. Um, so that's that's why they they moving towards that. But on time, our company are catching up, and that's why we're here for. Thank you, everybody, and special thank you to Virginia. Talk today.